After two years, I decided I was ready to get out there in the world, but I had no agent. Anyway, I got a commercial agent. He said, well, this is a Chesterfield ad. Do you smoke? I said, no. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll do it. It was a J. Walter Thompson, which was the number one advertising agency at that time in the whole world. I went back to my office and I said to my uh, assistant, I said, um, do you have a cigarette? I said, yeah. Well, light up, I want to see how you smoke because I'm going to see if I can get a Chesterfield ad. You know I don't smoke, so smoke. So we smoked in my office and I just coughed my ass off. Then I suddenly realized that if I smoked it like a joint, slow, I could actually take in a little smoke without coughing my brains out. You know, so anyway, I go down to J. Walter Thompson and I'm dressed pretty well because I'm coming from, there, from my office, so I look okay. And they invite me to come in and they have a, a big, comfortable chair a table, a shitload of cigarettes, and uh, some matches. And there were at least seven, eight guys there. All their Brooks Brothers suits, all looking perfect. They're sitting at their tables. They've got their pens ready. And uh, have a smoke, Mr. Stern. So I take a cigarette, I put it in my mouth, I light it, and uh, I put it down, and I sit back, take this big, and I get to here and I'm looking and nobody is looking at me. Nobody. And I'm going, what? all of a sudden I see them jump out of their chairs. The match has hit their Persian rugs. <laughs> 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 I didn't mean that to happen. It just happened. Oh, wow. And by the time the commotion got back, so everybody went back to their seats and crossed their legs did their thing. Eh. They said to me, do you fish? I said, yeah, of course I fish. I fish with my father all the time on the shore. Never fished in my life. <laughs> 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 For some reason, they gave me a Chesterfield commercial. Yeah. That's and, a, uh, it's a great ad, too. I mean, you look, you look uh, like you smoke. <laughs> I mean, you look like yeah. you're having a great time. <laughs> That's what they... Yeah. That's what they say, uh, you know, I've heard doctors say it before. If they ever ask you if you know how to do something, you just say, yes, yeah, very well, extremely well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Stop! Start smoking with a smile, with Chesterfield. Smiling all the while, with Chesterfield. Put a smile in your smoking, just give them a try. Light up a Chesterfield. They satisfy. Shortly after that, I got an agent. And he said to me, look, I'm going to send you to a bunch of auditions that you won't get. But it'll give you, you know, some feeling of what it's like. He sent me on some of the worst things I can imagine. So uh, I got to the point where he finally said, listen, tonight, why don't you go down and watch Never Too Late? It's a cute situation comedy. It's on Broadway. So I went to it. And frankly, first night I saw it, I laughed my ass off. I loved it, you know? And so, so the next day, I'm supposed to go and read. Go to the stage, and it's on an alley, and the alley is filled with guys reading. Oh, man. They're all reading, you know? And the uh, stage manager said, uh, here, here are the scenes we're gonna do. Uh, when you're finished, uh, let me know when you can go in there. I said, I'm ready. He said, but, he said, let's go. I, I knew the scenes they were going to do, but I didn't want to wait an hour to see every one of these fucking guys go in. If I'm going to get a no, give me a no right now. Let's go. So I go in there, and I read with the casting agent. I know the scenes. I read great. There's no problem. And I leave. I get home, and the phone's ring. It's my agent. What the hell did you tell them? I said, what do you mean, what the hell I told them? They asked me what I'd done. I told them I'd done nothing. What do you want me to tell them? Well, I don't know. All I know is they want you back. <laughs> I go, okay. <laughs> anyway, I go back and they give me the same scenes. I read the same way. At the end of it, somebody else says, all right, this is a woman. She said, my name is Judy Abbott. I'm, I'm Mr. Abbott's uh, daughter. 
but he's going to direct this in Florida. So we really got to know what you've done, seriously. And I said, Miss Abbott, I've never done anything. She looked at me like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> seriously? <laughs> seriously, you've never done anything? And I said, seriously, I've never done anything. I played a lot of sports and I'm not afraid to be in front of people. And I'm very relaxed and I have no preconceived ideas whatsoever. All I know is this was easy for me. So I go back to my place and the phone's ringing. So what the hell do you tell them now? From the agent. I said, Judy Abbott asked me what I did. I told them I've done nothing. What do you want me to tell them? He said, well, whatever you did, you yeah, they want you again. And I do the same thing again. There was a real good actor there reading. And then I read and that was it. I go back home. Blah, phone ring. All right, what now? He said, well, the producers and the director are having a real problem. I said, yeah, well, why? I said, well, the director, who's George Abbott, Mr. Abbott, I don't know if you know that name at all, but he was an icon. Oh, uh, we know, yeah. we know who he is. Mr. Abbott said, if they don't pick you, he isn't going to direct it. I never met George Abbott in my life. He's legendary. I mean, you're working with Stella Adler, Strasberg, you know, George Abbott. It's the first gig. You, I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. Was, was Mr. Abbott at those auditions himself, or was it just his daughter? No, he wasn't there. He was but in he, Florida. Okay. But he, he had someone telling him something about it. His daughter. So right, she, his daughter was his she daughter. She vouched for yeah. you and basically said, right. he's the guy. Um, sounds like right. And that was wow. Judy Abbott? Yeah. Yeah. So when I got to Florida, I'm there with Joan Bennett and Fred Clark, and they are scared to death of Mr. Abbott. I mean, visibly. And to me, this looked like a nice old man to me. I mean, he had gray hair, you know, he was older. He's just a nice guy. He worked out, and then one day he said, do you play golf? And I said, yeah, of course. He said, well, let's go play. And I went, sure. So we played a few rounds in Florida. It was really nice. You know, I come back and I do what I was supposed to do, you know, and uh, we open. It gets great reviews. I got a good review. I wasn't the least bit nervous. They were crazy. You know, Ben and Fred Clark were nuts. They were, they were so nervous. They just couldn't even, couldn't even, and they look at me and I'm like, no problem. Anyway, so we do it. It's fine get good reviews and everything and uh, I think it was about uh, mm -hmm. 10 days later I go on I go on the stage and I don't remember a single line I don't know one line from another line and that's what happens you know yeah. I'm, I'm a late I'm a late reactor so anyway I said what's a lot they had to prompt me through the whole damn show oh, and now they said don't worry about it that was still all that was it yeah. How did Bennett and Clark, I'm just curious, like, you know, since you didn't have any acting experience really at that time, I mean, you had training, but you hadn't really been on the stage. So how did, uh, you know, veteran performers treat you not having any experience? Did they accept you or were they more like, oh, you, you know, you didn't earn this type of attitude? No, they never gave me much attitude and uh, they, they were friendly, but they, they knew I was new, you know, and uh, Fred would give me advice. He was... A, a comedy king, you know. I mean, he was in, I don't know how many movies, probably hundreds. He was cool. They were going to London for the London company, and my agent said, well, nah, they're not taking you, they're dropping you, they're gonna take a British guy. Then I come back and I say, well, when are, they, when are they going? And I said, well, I don't know, they're having a fight now. What's the fight? The Mr. Abbott wants you, and the producers don't want you. They want a British guy to play the role, saves him a lot of money. I get a call a couple of days later and my agent says, George Abbott told them if they don't hire you, he's not direct. <laughs> what the fuck is going on here? It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so now I go to England and now he knows I play golf. So we're out in all these different towns like Oxford, Birmingham, uh, you name it. And they all have phenomenal golf courses. I mean, yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. It's so great. Anyway, we play and we play and we get to the about the third one. I turn to him. I'm on, I guess, the 12th or 13th hole. And I said to him, hey, how about a bet? The guy says, what do you want to bet? I said, I want to bet your first name. First of all, he laughs his ass off because nobody in the world calls him George. 
so. Not even his daughter calls him dad. She calls him Mr. Abbott, right? Oh, yeah, he is Mr. Abbott. Oh, yeah. Even to his daughter. I mean, that's uh, yeah, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And to everybody else who has known him, through all the shows yeah. he's done, he's, he's uh, Mr. So we get to 17 tall, and I say, George, get away. <laughs> he, start, he starts laughing so much, he can't even play. <laughs> he says, that's the funniest story I have ever heard in my life, and you're more than welcome to tell it. <laughs> that's it. Oh, man. So, so the kicker is I come back to rehearsal. Something happens, uh, you know, some movement. I say, hey, George, what if I... And as I turn, I look, and these people are frozen. Frozen. Oh. What? You can't get to call George. He's Mr. Abbott. He said, Fred, Mr. Abbott to you, but it's George to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's the best. Oh, oh so man. Good. You know, he's sort of responsible for what, what Broadway is now. Just more the, the types of plays that are that are really successful now. I think before he sort of came around, plays were a lot of maybe uh, heavy on social commentary or trying, trying to teach you something or make you learn something or you know, maybe Shakespeare and sort of serious dramas like that. But a lot of people want to just have fun and when they go to plays and have a good time and hear, hear some good songs. I think it's yeah. sort of revolutionary. No matter what it was, musical comedy, everyone wanted him to direct it. When I came back from the army, and I knew I had to straighten my act out because I had just been at a country club for two years. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, I got offers uh, from every one of those guys that I kidded around with at the golf club. Cash Oil, Madison Square Garden, uh, uh, the Brazier Company, a shoe company, number one, Miles. Uh, they all wanted me to work for them, and I, they didn't know, but, but I just wanted to be an actor. I didn't give a shit about it. Money was never number one with me, ever. I never let it interfere with my life. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've had a lot of money, and I've had no money. And they were the same. I doesn't buy you know, just being content, being happy, you know? Yeah. I, I get that. I think I think uh, a lot of people lose sight on what's important, which is just to be be happy in what you're doing. Where it doesn't feel like it's bullshit every day. The other guys stick to the rules. Why can't you? You know why? Because you're a troublemaker. You've been a pain in the neck ever since you joined this outfit. If you want this material, you listen to me. You better. I don't want to ever see you out of my sight again. Anything else? Yeah, plenty. Write me a letter. <laughs>